immune to the Alliance for Better District 6 stakeholders community meeting. Um, we'll start off the meeting with introductions. My name is Marvin Holtz. I'm President, Public Safety Chair, Land Use Chair, Parliamentarian, resident of this building, and I live on the 12th floor, and I've lived in the neighborhood 39 years. Michael? Hi, uh, my name is uh, Michael Nolte. I'm the Executive Director and uh, on the board of co-founder of the Alliance for Better District 6. The Alliance for Better District 6 was started in 1999 as a uh, uh, district-wide association to do improvements in their district, particularly around safety and affordability for housing, uh, safety and uh, cleanliness. Uh, and uh, we go around the room and do introductions now. And, uh, I'm Bradley Dunn. I'm a public information officer with the SFMTA. I'm also the District 6 liaison for the SFMTA. Uh, Joseph Landing on the state of Arizona. Stephen Acostolato with SGC Strategic Communications Consultant. Okay. Richard, uh, president here in this building. Okay. Uh, Commander David Lazar, San Francisco Police Department, Community Engagement Division. Kara Zarkata, I'm Policy Interim Supervisor, Dan Kim's office. Um, okay, well, put this a little back. Okay. I'm Susan Bryan, videographer uh, of Lions for a Better District 6. I'm a resident. I uh, live in the neighborhood. Thank you. On the back of your agendas are ground rules. Okay. We ask people to turn off papers, cell phones, electronic devices as we are videotaping. If you don't wish to be on the videotape, we ask that you stay behind the camera. We also ask that you don't hassle or name call people to create a safe environment for, for all participants. Feel free to speak by reserving any negativity towards, towards others. To speak responsibly and emphasize the positive. We also ask you not to interrupt other speakers or engage in side conversations or distracting behavior when others are speaking. Uh, we're not, not worried about politics. Okay, we're gonna, uh, the first thing that we have on the agenda is uh, adoption of the agenda. So is there any additions or uh, announcements? We'll be at the end if there's any additional announcements. Uh, so can I have a motion to accept the motion to approve? Is there a second? I so move. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any objections? Any no's? Um, um, next thing we do is our membership committee. Um, so I asked uh, our treasurer to uh, pass around the donation plan. Okay. So the Alliance is a uh, civic organization. Uh, there's only two ways that we uh, uh, get work money. The one is through uh, membership dues, and the other is through donations that are. Uh, Meetings. We don't receive any uh, money from the city, the state, the federal government, um, uh, and uh, we are a membership organization, so we deal with what the members want. So it's kind of a totally different kind of organization, maybe some of the other ones that you may know about. Um, we're a grassroots organization, and um, so uh, anyway, so uh, and the money that we get basically pays for all the various things we do. We have a lot of different projects we do during the year, including uh, just administrative stuff. So, uh, um, and we have all kinds of projects. If you look at our annual report, you get an idea of you know, some of the things we do um, beyond just having meetings. Um, yeah, and sponsoring meetings, too. Um, so, uh, the uh, first Speaker, I'll be passing out membership forms. But our first speaker is going to be uh, yes. uh, David Lazar. Yes. And you can introduce us. Stand right here. No. Sure. Okay, I'll just for the make camera. It. For the camera. Oh, for the camera. Yes. Beautiful. Is it working? Oh yes, it is. I don't want to break it with my uh -huh. my bad looks. Okay. 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 I. Um, I'll just be, I'll be super brief. Uh, I'm Commander Lazar with the San Francisco Police Department, who promoted. I oversee, pretty excited about uh, our new division called the Community Engagement okay. Division. 
Uh, it's a newly formed structure in our organization, really recommended by the Department of Justice, with the thought being that at a higher level within the police department, there should be um, you know, kind of a unified voice in terms of how we do our outreach, how we connect with the community, how we build partnerships, and it's very, very exciting. And my job is to work closely with the captains of each district station, promote out community engagement, something that I very, uh, very much enjoy. Uh, within my division no, is the school resource officer program, uh, the all the community and youth engagement programs like the Police Activities League, like our Wilderness Program, and then the third segment of community engagement is the homeless outreach. And so uh, I'm on point for the department, representing the police department on our effort to, to work with other agencies to address our homeless issue here in San Francisco. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty big task and I'm up to, up to the challenge. About 10 years ago, I was a lieutenant. I had a very similar role representing the department, so back again. Uh, I've just finished three years of being the captain at Central Station, so uh, look, work with the community, look forward to continue to work with the community. Uh, but just essentially in terms of our role is really to make sure that the police department as a partner in this effort is working well, and collaborating and coordinating uh, with the Department on Homelessness and Supportive Housing, Department of Public Health, Department of Public Works, our nonprofit partners, all the stakeholders in San Francisco working to address homelessness. And so we are, we have great communication, we have a conference call that we're involved in, meetings weekly, uh, and we're really working to support the new navigation center that's about to roll out at 1515 South Ben S, where we're, uh, we're all in favor of it. On behalf of the department, I can say we're in favor of the navigation center because we know that we're, we will work, uh, that the city will work to take people off the streets and out of tents and into places where they can receive some help. And the last thing I want to say is, you know, although we have a role, our role is really in the background. You know, we're here about we're here for public safety. We're here to make sure that people are safe, that situations are safe. But uh, the, the folks on the front line that we're supporting is the Department on Homelessness uh, and are the other agencies that are involved in dealing with it. And we, again, are all about safety uh, and getting helping folks get the help that they need. So exciting stuff, rolling out new. I'm glad to be a part of it. And uh, at this point, I'll take any questions from, uh, from the large audience. Um, I have a friend who works over uh, in the planning building. Yes. Um, and there, they, he always talks about the encampments that are on the sidewalk under the freeway. And I'm wondering if there is a uh, uh, plan that's being talked about on a way to gently and kindly move them <coughs> somewhere like a navigation center. Yeah, so uh, that part is actually the northern border of the area that we've identified for the navigation. So in other words, that part of the division all the way out to Cesar Chavez, we're looking for individuals who have been in tents and, and, and have been homeless and have been in encampments, and we're gonna work really hard to try to get them into the navigation center once it opens up. So we're pretty excited about that. And uh, yeah, so um, as far as the opening, uh, you know, the projection is probably at the end of the month or maybe in the next month, but we're very, very, the city is very, very close to having uh, this navigation center open up 26th and South Dennis. Well, not a question, just commentary. Thanks for three years of great service at Central. Thank you. And they could have been the better guy to take the lead on this project. Thank, thank you. I want to thank you. You're proactive. You're attentive. Uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out great. Great. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to work with you as well. And thank you all of you. Okay, um, the next person on the agenda is the district attorney. Hello everyone, my name is Tom Osley. I'm with the district attorney's office. Specifically, I work in the crime strategies unit. And so I'm just going to tell you quickly what the crime strategies unit does, and specifically what I'm doing here in Southern and Timberland. So, have you ever seen that movie Moneyball with, about the Oakland A's? It's kind of that same concept. It's um, 
kind of intelligence driven prosecution. So instead of just waiting for a crime to be committed and then responding to that, is we kind of look for crime drivers, um, either particular individuals that are driving crime or hot spots where certain types of crime are occurring and then focusing our efforts on that. Now specifically, I've been assigned to Southern and Tenderloin and that means that I'm either at Tenderloin Station or Southern Station a couple days a week. The rest of the week I'm at the Hall of Justice. Um, I'm still going to be having a trial caseload. Um, in the past three years I've done 27 uh, trials here at the, at the Hall of Justice and a lot of those cases came out of Southern and Tenderloin. So that was one of the reasons why I asked to be assigned here because I'm already familiar with some of the issues that the neighborhood faces and some of the crimes that are being committed. And the things that I'll be able to do or that we're going to be focusing on are things like getting stay away orders. So if a crime's committed and in a particular area, a lot of times a stay away order will be, for instance, 150 yards or 150 feet. And then there'll be an argument about why the stay away order should be modified because the person's either getting services or something like that. But a lot of times it's not actually the case. Um, they're from out of the county and they're coming here to commit crime. So one of the things I'll be able to do is find that out, flag those cases, and I can go down at the arraignment and make sure that stay away orders are signed. I can also, and you'll have my contact information, if there's particular areas of the tenderloin that you're interested in, or there's particular types of crime that you're particularly concerned about, when those types of cases come across my desk, I can email you, let you know what's going on, and then if there's something you want me to convey to the court, for instance, when they're setting bail, I can do that. So if you were particularly concerned with auto burglaries on the 200 block of Eddy, if an auto burg happens from the 200 block of Eddy, I can email and say, hey, this is going on, the case is being arraigned in a couple of days, is there anything you want me to tell the judge? Or you can come down yourself and say, hey, I live on that block, and you want the judge to start signing stairways. So um, that's one way that I'd be able to work with people as far as making sure that crimes are prosecuted and stay orders are obtained and the other thing is, is if cases, um, if you want to know the status of the case or what's going on, feel free to email me. If it's not my matter, I'll refer you to the right person. Um, but uh, that's essentially what I do. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, we have an ongoing problem with uh, people that stay away orders to the coroner. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering, what's the DA's office position on prosecuting people that don't do what they're supposed to do? Particularly those people that are repeat offenders. Here's, well one, the DA's position is there's a stay away order they should abide by. So there is no, once a stay away order has been signed by a judge, the only way to modify that is to come in and basically pitch their reason to modify it to the judge. But I'll, I'll give you an example of like just how frustrating this can be. I had a case with 16th admission, this is before I was assigned here and I was a general felonies DA. 16th admission, there's a stay away order, a person had seven drug sales from 16th admission. I'm asking for the stay away order, the, the arraignment on the seventh case, and the public defender's argument is, no, no, she lives there at 16th admission. And you can't do a stay away because she won't be able to go home. So the judge refused to sign the stay away. I then um, asked the officers uh, from Mission Station to go verify that. And they were great. They went right down to the hotel. They talked to the hotel manager and said, hey, do you know this person? Does she live here? And the response was, not only does she not live here, she sells crack out in front of my hotel all the time, and she won't go away. So we then went back, tried to get the stay away order again, and then she had rent receipts. She actually went to a stationery store, bought a receipt pad, and made up in fraudulent rent receipts to get around getting a stay away order. So the sergeant from Mission Station went and got exemplars of the actual receipt book, got a statement from the person working the front desk saying, no, that person doesn't uh, live here, went back for a third time to try and get the stay away. At that point, the judge was willing to sign the stay away, but there was no repercussions, no penalty for repeatedly lying and wasting everybody's time. So that's one of the biggest frustrations with things like stay -aways. And the part of the problem is, is that the judge has what the defendant's asking for, which is not to have a stay away, but nothing going on the other side. And so if people in the neighborhood, for instance, once if that person from the hotel had come in at arraignment and said, no, she doesn't live in my hotel, 
and it's a blight on my neighborhood. I have people in my hotel that are in recovery, that are trying to stay away from drugs, and here's a person offering it to them every time they come home. Um, that's like one of the problems. So there are solutions to those things, and one of them is, is working with the community to make sure that the courts understand just what effect this criminal behavior is having on, you know, just getting home at the end of the night, feeling safe in your own neighborhood. So to the extent that people don't want to be involved or don't feel comfortable coming down to court, an email to me saying, I live on this block and here's what the issues are, I can take that and I can read it to the court. If you want your name to be kept anonymous, I can do that as well. I'll have to give a copy to the public defender, but I'll redact it first to take the name and email off and tell them I'm going to, you know, mention this when we arrange the case. Uh, most of the people we have down here that have daily orders don't live in San Francisco. Absolutely. Um, yeah. For the most part, they probably live in the East Bay. They did, almost. And um, so I don't see them using, well, I live here as an excuse. No, they say they live here. So I, I've been doing this for, like I said, three years when I was in general felonies. So a lot of the, just the East Bay cases. So there's a particular type of crime. It's mostly people that are from the East Bay. They come over every day, they commit crime, and then they go back on BART. Uh, the, originally they were putting down their addresses on this international boulevard in Oakland. And then we started getting stayaways because they're not eligible for services here. So if you're not from San Francisco and you're not eligible for San Francisco services, because you're living in Oakland, then you can't use that as an excuse to get out of the stayaway order. So once the stayaway order started getting signed, they stopped giving addresses when they were being arrested. So they put, their, they put down their addresses transient, and they say that they're homeless in the temple. They're not. They're going home to Oakland every night. And so they just lie and say that they're homeless in order to get around and stay away. And so then once we find out that that's the case, then we push back the other way, showing no, they're actually not homeless and they're actually, you know, coming to the Tenderloin every day to take a back. Now, the other thing that we could do, the one nice thing about stayaways is that it's a court order and most judges don't like it when somebody doesn't do something that they specifically told them not to do. And depending on the judge, uh, they're usually much more receptive to signing them, especially when someone has already violated the court order that they told them to abide by. Now, the other thing that we're able to do is if you <clears throat> are willing to give me the information and, and give this to, there's three prelim departments, three different departments where people are arraigned. You don't have to come down every time. I mean, once the judge hears, because no one ever does, no one ever sends emails or comes down or does this, once a judge hears it for the first time, they're going to remember it. You know, if you have one case on the 200 block of Eddie and tell the judge what it's like and what you guys have to put up with, then the next time there's a stay away order, the judge is going to remember it. So you don't need to come down every time, but if you do it once, it's enough to try and get them to start signing stayaways. Um, the other thing is, is the geographical location. I was getting stayaways, and what I was doing was, is if it's a low level crime, I would stipulate to OR, so I would stipulate to releasing the defendant without bail where they wouldn't have to post money, as long as they agreed to stay out of from 4th Street to 11th, um, all the way up Van Ness. So basically stay out of South of Market, from Howard up to O'Farrell, from you know uh, 4th Street all the way up to Van Ness. So it's a big geographical area. But if they stay out of that, then I would agree to not ask for bail. And so even when their attorney was telling them, no, they don't want to stay away, they're like, I'll take it. I don't want to post bail. If I can get out for free, I'll do it. So there's ways to do that. Then we have a stay away for a large geographical area and we don't have people committing crime in one block and then they get a stay away and just go two blocks over and do the same thing there. Any other questions for anybody? Yes, one yeah. of the, the biggest problems we have is uh, drugs uh, being sold in school zones. And uh, obviously that in itself should be a deterrent uh, on the manic, uh, and uh, there should be like a to, to say, well, we're within the bound, you know, where we did was in the boundaries of the uh, zone for uh, being in the school zone when you sold your drugs. Is, yeah, there's a, is, a. I would assume you have that in your tool box. There is. And that's the nice thing is that the officers here at Tenderloin have been absolutely fantastic as far as uh, not just putting down the distances, they will attach a Google map or attach the information about how far it is but they also contact the school to make sure that they were operating and that they're open and that they're in business. But the problem is, and this is, again, this is just my opinion of the problem based on the fact that I've been in Department 9 for over two years, is that 
I don't think that the judges have a clear sense of exactly what kind of impact it's having on the community. And so 